All right, good afternoon, folks. I've got a uh, longish video to make today. Well, we'll see how long it is. Um, this is a actual paid request. I appreciate this. Um, I received a generous donation from JB from Portland. Um, and so I guess I gotta take this seriously. <laughs> um, I've got notes, so that, that will help me out. Um, JB has interested in a Speedmaster, particularly, I think, the Moonwatch. So we're gonna go into that um, in some depth today. He also has some other general questions about buying watches used. So we'll, we'll, um, we'll touch upon a bunch of different things. What I'll do is I'll read through his email and then I have some notes for in response to um, each of his questions. Um, yeah, again, I wanna just clarify as far as donations and such go, um, if you email me, and my email is in the about page, um, and ask me to do a video request, it's, it's by no means required um, to donate or to give me money <laughs> to make a video. It will expedite the video and I do appreciate it because it does take time um, to make these. So yeah, it's, but it's don't feel like you have to do it. It's by no means, you know, I'm not gonna be mad or, you know, so I'm not gonna be like the barista that doesn't get the tip. <laughs> um, anyways, so let's let's take a look at JB's um, email. All right, so JB says, love your videos. You seem to be one of the more rational watch reviewers out there. Thank you, JB. Um, I can be irrational too. <laughs> um, I'm considering buying a used Speedmaster and I've been looking at, it, at a few on eBay. I like the one with the included moon phase, the 3876.50. What do you think? But I am all confused about different vintages, movements, etc. What is a normal price range for a newer used Speedmaster? All right, so in order to answer this question, I need to go into what a Speedmaster is and a little bit of the history because I think that will help you understand what you're looking at. Um, you know, it's, there, there are a few, Omega has several different ranges. But they really have two ranges that are their 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 main ranges of watches, and that's one is the Speedmaster, and the other is the Seamaster. There's also the Deville, and there's some other ones, but um, the Planet Oceans and and the Aquaterra, they're both offshoots of the Seamaster, although they really almost consider them different watches. Um, so the Seamaster is the dive watch, of course, while the Speedmaster is a sports watch. Um, and as far as I understand it, the, well, we'll talk about the history in a moment. Just to go into your, your question about price, um, you know, prices range really widely for Speedmasters because there's a wide array of different Speedmasters. Um, they, the cheapest ones I've seen are in the $1,000 to $1,500 range, but those aren't the professional, those aren't the moon watches. Um, and they tend to be, I think, 1980s, 90s, 2000s. Um, used mo models, there's tons of them out there on eBay. Um, and for used watches, they go all the way up to six, seven, eight thousand dollars for the dark side of the moon. Um, and I'm sure there's some limited editions that are expensive like that. By the way, we're listening to Miles Davis in a silent way, one of, one of his best. I played it on this here before. Um, it's nice because I like this album because it, um, it's still Miles being exploratory, like it's not just straight up bebop, but it's not, it's like before he did too much drugs. <laughs> um, some of his stuff in the early 70s, early to mid 70s, it's great, you know, like a Garta, Pangea, that sort of thing. Um, but it tends to be pretty intense and hard for background music. Um, one of my favorites is Live Evil, which is a, um, live album around the same era, a little, maybe a couple years later. Anyways, In a Silent Way, I think it's 1968. Um, yeah, anyways, so so back to the Speedmaster. Um, so, but if you're talking about the Moonwatch, um, the price range for a newer used Speedmaster Professional, AKA the Moonwatch, is generally between about $2,000 and $3,000 US dollars. Generally around $2,500 to $3,000 for like good condition, relatively recent, um, 
used Moonwatch. Um, you can find them for less. I've seen them for under 2000 but generally there's a condition problem or something. Um, so yeah, be looking around 2500 up to about 3000 And I think new, you can get them on the gray market for about 3500 now, 3600 I think Amazon, when I was doing some research for this video, Amazon has it for 3600 and something or other, maybe 3700 So the Speedmaster line itself goes back to 1957. Um, and the first... Um, Speedmaster was the CK2915 or Broad Arrow. Um, it's called the Broad Arrow because the hands on it are, are they're more arrow-like. Um, so let's take a look at that. I'll, I'll put a picture up so you can see what I'm talking about. Okay, as you can see, the, the CK2915 or Broad Arrow it's similar to the Moonwatch, um, the later on Moonwatch, um, but it's got a metal bezel and it's also got broad arrow hands. And I think the other difference, let me just take another look at it, um, the other difference is the lugs are, are straighter and squarer. Um, it doesn't have the, 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 the same curved uh, angled lugs of the, the classic Moonwatch. Um, but this is you can you could look at this as the this is the predecessor to the moon watch it's not the moon watch but it's very similar and it's a it's a collector's item in its own right um a lot of people prefer i actually prefer the broad arrow hands to the later the narrow thin hands um so this was also i think at the time uh, omega was the official timekeeper for the olympics so it, it came out at a time when they were the timekeeper for the olympics chronographs were still relatively new. I think there were some chronographs going back to the 20s. This was one of the first ones that you could actually wear on your wrist. Um, it's 39 millimeters across the bezel, has a light crystal, um, and the movement is the caliber 321, which was designed in 1942, um, and it was used as the basis for chronographs um, from companies such as Patek Philippe, Vacheron, Constantin, Breguet, maybe others, I'm not sure. So it was, you know, it's a prestigious chronograph movement. Um, now, there were a couple different variations at this time, and they, they recently reissued, um, like, a, a new version of the 57, which they're calling the Speedmaster 57. So if you go to the Omega website, you go to the Speedmaster section, they, they're selling something called the Speedmaster 57, and it's a bi-compax model um, that I think actually looks really great. I'm, I'm a big fan of the, um, let me just see if I can get a picture up here for you. Um, it comes on a, I think it comes in a variety of models, but I really like the one with the, the strap is really cool. But yeah, it's one, it's one of the, um, the Speedmaster 57, you know, it's, it's really the, um, let's just, here, let me, let me just take you over here so I don't have to actually stop the, so that, that's the Speedmaster 57. Um, so you can buy these new now, they're, they're manufacturing these again. It's got a beautiful bi-compacts, large bi-compacts, you know, I, I think it's, I think the new one has, has a light crystal, I'm not sure. Um, so yeah, broad arrow hands. So, but that that is not your moon watch yet. It's it's the it's the father of the moon watch. Um, so they 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 started changing this. I think by 1959 they had one called the CK2998, which had narrower hands. And then in 1962, the well-known baton hands came out, and those were that was on the ST105.002. Um, so that was the baton hands that you see later on in the moon watches. Um, and then the next year in 63, the ST 105.012 came out and that the case became larger. It was 42 millimeters and it had the, the later curved asymmetrical lugs. Um, and this is pretty much the same classic moon watch that we see today. Um, they added the word professional in 1965. Um, and in 1968, they replaced the movement, the 321 caliber movement, with the 861. 
<clears throat> which is pretty much still used today. I think there's the 1861, which is basically the same thing. Um, it was cheaper to make um, and more accurate. So you, you're talking about a watch that in terms of its actual appearance has been pretty much the same since 1963 or 65, depending upon whether the professional word is important to you. Um, and then from 1968 on, it's been pretty much the same watch. Um, they're still making the same watch with, I mean, the bracelet's different. We'll get into that later. Um, and so since then, you know, because it was such a big deal, um, it became, you know, the, the moon watch, there's so many different variations of it. And I think that's what um, our friend JB is having a hard time with because there's so many variations. And I'm gonna go into that a little bit. Um, I'm not gonna go into the anniversary editions, the limited editions, the moon phases, all that. Just understand that there, there's there's a core professional moon watch, then there's some variations off that you, that you have to be careful about. And then from there, there's the, the anniversary editions, limited editions, moon phases, etc. cetera. Um, so I'll, I'll go into that a little bit later on though. Um, so what, one of the things though that I wanted to mention that's really cool about the moon watch is that I believe it's the most tested watch ever. Like it's, it went through so many different tests um, and it also beat out other brands. There were, there were basically suitors, NASA had suitors for who would make the moon watch. And I think among them was Rolex, Breitling, Hamilton, and Longines, but Omega won out. So that's, that's what the moon watch is. So it has, you know, it has significance, not only because it walked on the moon, it, it was <laughs> the space watch, the moon watch, but also just the process that went up to it. It really was cutting edge design. It, it went through an enormous amount of testing. So then when you get to 1968, 69, you have this official NASA watch. Um, and speaking of which, I think I have a cool picture to show. Here, let me, let me show you. This is one of the original ads um, for the moon watch. Okay. So we'll come back to the Speedmaster in terms of my recommendations as to how to proceed for JB. Um, but I always want to give you an, a broad overview of the history of the, the Speed, uh, Speedmaster. Um, you know, not only were there variations of the professional, I should mention this, there's also other Speedmaster lines that weren't the professional. And we'll get into that later. Um, all right. So, JB asks, I was wondering if you had a have a video on the potential pitfalls of buying used. Um, I don't think I've, I actually made an official video on that, but I think I've talked about it. Um, but I'll just the shorthand version, I'll, I'll kind of mention a few things to consider. Um, now, of course, there's te technically more risk involved whenever you buy um, used. It's just, it's a used watch. Um, somebody else wore it. Um, and there's probably going to be scuffing. So sometimes when I bought this, this is my um, um, Omega Seamaster Electric Blue. I bought this with, um, they had just serviced it. And when you service a watch, they actually polish it up. They actually, it's not just, not just uh, servicing the move. Servicing is actually really intense. For those of you who don't know what goes into a service, it's pretty amazing. They pretty much take the whole thing apart piece by piece, clean it, put it back together, lubricate it, etc. And then they also do cosmetic work, like they work on any minor scratches. I don't know if they were, they'd probably replace the crystal, I'm not sure. That might cost extra. Um, but a, um, what was I, what was I saying? So, so yeah, so you, you never know what condition you're getting. So it's really important to look at the pictures. Um, and when you buy used, generally there's a few different people that you'd be buying from. One would be a, an actual dealer, um, especially if it's an authorized de dealer, that's very pref preferable. A dealer doesn't want to sell you a piece of crap. Um, dealers tend to be more expensive. They tend to, they often service the watches before they sell them. Um, and depending upon the dealer, yeah, you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna get a. I, I would have no qualms with buying three. You know, Jewelers on Time is one that Archie Luxury and TGV have both mentioned, and I think they're really legit. Um, I think uh, Kenny Nguyen 
who's one of the guys that works there, he, he participates on some of the um, um, Facebook. I don't know if it's Andy Hunter's or if it's Dennis Van Patten's, but he, he's on there. I've heard nothing but good things about jewelers on time. And there are other dealers like that that are, are reputable, that they want to sell you a good watch. It will be more expensive than buying from a private seller. So the other, so there's dealers, there's pawn shops, and then there's private sellers, and they will all sell. Um, I mean, the main place most people look on eBay. Um, Watch Recon is another place um, that that I use a lot because Watch Recon is a site that searches for through other forums um, and uh, private seller forums. I've sold on there, I've bought on there, never had a problem. I like buying through private sellers because 95 plus percent of the time you're, you're buying from somebody that loves watches and they, they, they're enthusiastic about the hobby and you might even strike up a conversation about um, what watches you have, what they have, you know. It's a little nerve wracking because especially if you're spending thousands of dollars, it's, it's a little nerve wracking just sending somebody money um, and then hoping the watch shows up. But I think, you know, for the most part, it's, it's pretty safe. It's pretty safe. Um, you know, the other thing, and this is the other thing that I would really, really recommend, is when you buy used, especially from a private seller, but certainly on, on eBay, use PayPal and use merchandise. Do not buy a watch as a gift. You, the, there's an option that you can send money as a gift which basically means that you're charged rather than them. It's like 3%. It's not a lot, 3%. That's, that's not why I'm saying don't do that. The reason I'm saying don't do that is when you send money as a gift, you're not as protected as when you send money as merchandise. Because, and this is this is the tricky thing. I, I've been screwed by this both uh, through, through selling. Um, I sent a watch, it was in, in Invictus. It wasn't that much, maybe 150 bucks or something um, to Brazil and I learned never to send anything to Brazil again because there's no tracking, there's no protection. As soon as um, eBay gives a range of delivery, and as soon as that range ends, the person contacted me and said I didn't get the watch. I'm fairly certain they did. I mean, it was it was very convenient that they waited exactly until that date. Um, and I think that that's a bit of a easy scam. And I and I I learned the hard way that you just don't do that. There's other. Most countries, you can't ship internationally with um, tracking. Um, so, but if you sell through PayPal, um, you know, they, 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 PayPal wants to protect the buyer more than anything else. So when you're buying a watch, they'll protect you. They want, they want you to get your merchant. They don't want you to be afraid to use PayPal. So I'm not saying you should, but you, you know, you, you have more power in a sense as the buyer using PayPal. Um, so yeah, if a if a, I mean sometimes seller sellers private sellers want you to bank wire them, and I get it, you know I get it, um, because it is risky. But you know, I I wouldn't send money through bank wire. I wouldn't send money through um, uh, as a gift. S send it as 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 merchandise. Um, you know, and as far as the watch itself goes, just really examine the picture. You know, really look at the pictures. Um, you're, you know, you you can ask somebody. I've I've <laughs> one thing I found is that I feel like it's more. Um, what's the word? Um, I trust my own eyes more than I trust the description of the seller. And if the pictures are good, if they're not good, get better pictures. Make sure say, listen, send me better pictures. Um, and if they can't, or if they do, they don't, they say, well, I just don't. I'd move on. You know, you want really good pictures to look at. Um, it, it's just more trustworthy to actually see. You can see. I I have seen things on pictures that the seller said wasn't there, and then I've asked the seller, and they've said, "Oh, I don't see it." And then I say, "No, I see it." And they're like, "Oh, yeah, you're right." Um, I bought a watch years ago. It was, a, it was an Invicta again in my early years, where there was what looked to me like rust, and I asked them, "Is that rust?" And they said, "No, it's not." Um, and then I got the watch, and it was rusty, and it actually couldn't couldn't even open it. Um, and and then I sent it back, and he's like, "Oh yeah, 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 you're right." So you know, you you got to trust your own your own eyes. Make sure you really look over the pictures. And you know, 
if if you're really picky about condition, you might not want to buy used. Buying a used watch, you know, unless it's been recently serviced, there's going to be scuffing, there's going to be minor cosmetic issues. And for, that doesn't bother me particularly. I, I don't mind. It, it gives it some character. I mean, it was a watch that was owned by other people. Um, my Breitling Crosswind Racing um, has lived on three continents. <laughs> Australia. I bought it from an Australian who bought it from, I think, an Englishman. Um, and I'm in North America. And if and when I sell it someday, maybe I'll sell it to an Asian or an African or an Antarctican. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, it, a used watch is a used watch. So, so you have to go into it knowing you're not gonna get something that's perfect. Um, but it gives it some character. And I think, you know, most things are fixable. Even, even little scrapes on the crystal, it's not the end of the world. I've bought in watches that have minor cosmetic on the crystal even. That's just me. Some people really want everything perfect. But also remember, as soon as you put it on and wear it for a day or two or a week, you're going to get desk diver scuffs. It's just going to happen. So it's up to you. Um, the other thing that I, I would consider as far as buying used is, is consider the date of the last service. Now, a lot of people won't know when it was serviced, but understand that to service, you're interested JB's interested in um, Speedmaster, which are chronographs, and, and Omega chronographs cost seven or eight hundred dollars to service. It's a very complex piece of machinery, and they have to take it apart bit by bit, and they put it, I mean, it takes hours and hours, I'm sure. Um, so, and you can probably find a reputable watch maker who will service it for four or five hundred, I'm not sure. But yeah, seven, eight hundred dollars. Um, now, the thing with services is that People, Omega says every five years, even every four to five years. Um, that's sort of like um, a car dealership saying, get your, your car, uh, the oil change every two to 3,000 miles. You don't have to do that. Really, it's 5,000 plus for, for oil change. Um, as long as there's not an oil leak and as long as you check it every once in a while to make sure it's holding its level, you don't need to. You don't need to change your oil every three thousand miles. You really don't. It's really, it's it's much more than that. I think it's the same with watch servicing. Um, I think five years would be the bare bare minimum, and that more likely eight to ten. And that's really, especially if you wear it with other watches. If if you wear it, if if you rotate it with other watches, your your watch is getting rest time. It's not. There's not as much wear and tear. Um, but pretty much beyond 10 years, you got to start thinking about it because, you know, when a watch, when the lubricants dry out, I don't know exactly if they dry out, or they drain, I don't think they drain, then you get wear, it's like, it's like losing your cartilage in your knees, the, the pieces, there might actually be damage done. Um, so yeah, but I, I think you can safely go seven, eight years, 10 years. I've heard people going longer with, with Omegas. I mean, they're, they're good watches. But I think once you get to 10 years, I definitely would seriously consider a service. Um, all right, so what is the meaning? What, is, what exactly is the meaning of gray market? So gray market basically means it's a non-authorized dealer. The most, probably the most well-known gray market shop is Joma's shop. Um, they're somewhat infamous actually. Um, but there's tons of them out there. Um, um, well, I can't even think. Authentic watches is a big one, um, and they they uh, they they tend to be quite a bit less expensive. I think a good example of this is that like an Omega Planet Ocean 42 millimeter, 8500 movement. I think the the retail is 6200, 6200, something like that. Um, the um, Joma shop would sell it for about four thousand one hundred, so it's about you know thirty percent off, if not more, um, and that's pretty standard. You get about a third off of the MSRP at a gray market price. Um, I think authorized dealers, you will go down a little bit from that sixty-two hundred. I'm not sure. I haven't bought from an authorized dealer, but. Um, 
<clears throat> so that so what what a, the reason why it's less expensive is there's no manufacturer's warranty. Um, when you buy from an authorized dealer, a lot of what you're paying for is a warranty, often three years or more, that you know to take care of this or that issues that might arise with a watch. Um, I mean, now whether <laughs> you should do this or not, I mean it's it's really it's like insurance. You know, do you pay insurance or not? Um, if you rent a car. Are you going to get the insurance? Or are you going to hope that yours covers it? Or are you going to check into that? You know, different people, some, some people are more or less paranoid about that sort of thing. Um, Joma's shop and other, store, other shops like it, gray market shops, they do usually offer warranties, but I think they're usually one year. And they're not manufacturer warranties. They're, they're Joma shop warranties, which means if there's something wrong with the watch, I don't know if they'd replace it. I don't know exactly what they'd do. Uh, so it's greater risk, but it's still very small risk, right? Because chances are you buy a new Omega Speedmaster and it's, it's, it's gone through quality control. There's not gonna be anything wrong with it, but there's some risk, right? But it's small. So, um, all right, so then you ask, uh, I, I have heard of some purchasers receiving used watches with serial numbers scratched off. This obviously hurts the resale value. Yes, it does. Um, this has never happened to me, though. I mean, it sounds sketchy. So I, <laughs> I definitely wouldn't buy a watch that had the serial number scratched off. I, there's no, clearly it was stolen, right? Um, okay, next question. When the watch is advertised as having no cards, I assume this is from an unauthorized dealer. What are the implications for buying a no cards watch? Well, so there's two things. There's cards and there's papers, and they're two separate things. Um, card, the card refers to the warranty card, so you're right. Um, that's an unauthorized dealer. That's the card that you, you give the number to Omega when you send it in, and they fix your watch. Papers is more of proof of authenticity. So if you have the papers, it's where you bought it from. It's verifying that it's an authentic watch. I, I don't know if cards verify the authenticity as well. Probably. Um, but it doesn't mean anything necessarily. People lose their papers. People lose their that, that sort of stuff all the time. Um, some people don't care. Some people buy a watch thinking, oh, I'll never sell this. What's all this junk? I'll throw it away. It's like keeping your receipts. Um, I mean, I think in general, you want to buy watches with papers and or cards, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't hold to that. I haven't always done that. Um, I, I think more importantly, as far as authenticity goes, is, is who you're buying it from. Uh, my chronograph Seamaster had no cards or papers, and I got a better deal for it, um, but I trusted the source. It was a big s store on eBay, really good um, positive feedback. You know, they don't want, they, they, they check these things. Uh, even pawn shops will check the authenticity. Um, because they don't want it to come back to them either. Um, and you'll also be able to get significantly better value. I think, I think in general, my guess is like 20% price difference. So that also, that's also affects you in terms of re resale. So for instance, the same watch with or without papers might be around 2,500 versus 2,000. And that also goes into whether you can, how you can resell it. So again, I would, I would try to, you want papers and cards, but it's not a have to if you can find some other way to verify the authenticity. And sometimes you can do that just through looking at it, just through an eyeball test. Um, but I think the main thing is buying from somebody who seems trustworthy. Um, all right, do you have a favorite site for used Omegas? I may want a Seamaster too. Um, well, not really other than Watch Recon. I look at Watch Recon, Lion Seek also has a lot of watches. Um, I, I don't like their format as much. I think Watch Recon's easier to use. As I said, Watch Recon is a search engine. It searches other, it searches forums, basically. Um, all the big watch forum sites have a private sales forum. So Watch Recon searches a bunch of them. And then, then you, you know, you get to see what's out there. You get to see what the different prices are. Um, What's the one that Archie likes? It's called uh, Chrono 24. Um, I don't use that as much. I think that's more international. Um, 
Sometimes it's good to look up specific watches, but yeah, so Chrono 24, but yeah, Watch Recon is what I like to use. I also use, I've, I've bought watches on eBay uh, multiple times. I haven't had a problem with that. But eBay is, it's a little, Watch Recon you're buying from private sellers, generally, that love watches, that, that are selling you their watch that they loved. And they don't want to get burnt, they don't want, to, they don't want to screw you because they don't want to be screwed, right? Whereas eBay, you got to be careful, you got to look at feedback. Um, I, I wouldn't buy from a store with, with little feedback. I, you, I think quantity is an important thing. If they have thousands of feedback and it's 99% or higher, 98% or higher, gen, you're probably going to be okay. But I've seen people selling with zero or 15, right? 15 feedback and 67%. I would never, I wouldn't touch it, right? Um, all right. So yeah, Watch Recon's my main, my main recommendation. All right, the Speedmaster has special significance to me as the day I took my first step was the day the men walked on the moon. So I can't not have one. I totally get it. I think that's that's awesome. That's <laughs> So I assume that means you, you were born in 1968. I, I don't know the date, 1969, the moonwalk. Um, uh, moonwalk date. Let's just Google that. July 20th, 1969. So I assume that you were born sometime in the middle, in maybe summer 68. Um, yeah, I totally get that. I've, I've seen some people like to get the moon, the moon watch of their birth year. So for you, it'd be the 1968 or the 1969 would be cool too. But that could be really hard to find and also possibly expensive. I, I think those years in particular, my guess is are very, very expensive. Um, so this end of the first email I said thanks for your time JB in Portland P.S. you were a total hipster and I can't believe you don't live in Portland <laughs> well I did as I said in response to, to JB by email I did live in Portland for about 12, 11 years from 1996 to 2007 with about a year and a half in California 2002, 2003, I was in California and Asia, in India mainly. Um, but for the most part, I lived in Portland for about 11, 12 years. Um, and I loved it, and I thought of moving back. Um, I left for schooling for a graduate degree, and then came back east for a job. Um, and now we're thinking of another move, but I think we're gonna stay on the East Coast because my family is all here. Um, plus I read that New Yorker article about the the magnitude 9 earthquake that is due at some time in the next 40 50 years something to consider for the pacific northwest folks all right not to freak you out buy the watch you want that's the point so all right so in, in a later email jb asks also might suggest model numbers hesalite versus sapphire 861 versus 1861 Vintage versus newer, etc., etc. I have about a dozen model numbers written down, and making sense of them all is tough. So this might be like going through every single number is a little bit beyond my pay grade. I think <laughs> um, there are sites out there. There's one I was looking at that is totally confusing to me, but you might want to look at it. I'll put it also. It's Chronomatics. It's a history of the Speedmaster. It only goes out through 2005 but it goes through so many. It's very, very detailed and it tells you every little detail about, and there's probably other stuff. I would just Google it, um, but I can go a answer some specifics. Um, let me just get this. The song's about to end. <clears throat> and I wanna make sure that what comes up next isn't horrible. Let's turn it down a little bit. Um, but I can answer some of these specific questions you have and hopefully guide you or give you a, a point in the right direction for the kind of Speedmaster that you want. Um, so perhaps to start, the biggest differentiation is Speedmaster Professional versus just Speedmaster. Um, the Speedmaster Professional is pretty much the Moon Watch and its variations. Um, and they're all generally manual wind with Hesalite crystals. There are no, there are Sapphire Moon Watches, but, but purists, Okay, for whatever reason, my camera um, 
turned off, but I think the battery's fine. So I was gonna read off the new model number for the Moonwatch, which is replacing the 3570.50 model number. So the new number is 311.30.42.30.01.005. Very confusing. Um, you can Google it, just look up 3570 model number. I mean, if you look up the Moonwatch on um, Amazon, they'll have it listed as that. Um, now, one thing though, that if, there's a couple things within that model. There's ways to read Omega model numbers. I don't really know, but I know for instance, like the 42 means 42 millimeter bezel. Um, all the numbers mean something. But the last three are particularly important because the 005 means it's a Hesalite crystal. There's one that I think has the same model number except it says 006, which means it's the Sapphire version. Something to consider. Um, one other really cool thing to consider, I know you don't want to wait this long, but they're designing, Omega's designing a watch for Mars. And I think there's supposed to be a Mars trip in, you know, 15 years or something like that. Um, so there, there's gonna be a Mars watch eventually too, which could be kind of cool. Um, so as far as as which moon watch to get, if that's if that's the way you want to go, um, versus the Speedmaster 57 or one of the other Speedmasters, um, I think what you need to ask yourself is, well, how authentic do you want to go? How how authentic do you want to go? Um, so first, you know, to start, there's the professional. You want the moon watch professional, um, and. It sounds like for, for, for JB, because you were you walked on the same day that the moonwalk happened, you want the moonwatch, you want the professional. So I would go for that and maybe later on consider other Speedmaster models or Seamasters. Um, like the 57 would be a great one to have because it's the precursor. So then I, then I would ask yourself, do you want a vintage piece or do you want something more recent? If you want a vintage piece, you're talking about the 60s and 70s, when the actual moonwalk moon walk happened. There's something nice about that, but you're also getting a watch that's 40, 50 years old. So that's that's something for you to figure out. I mean, I could see the appeal of getting one that was 1968 or 1969, because that's the year you were born and then the year of the actual moonwalk. Walk. Um, and that becomes tricky and hard. I, I don't know. I, for a while I was looking at, I was born in 1973, and I was looking for a moon watch of 73, and I didn't find one, but I didn't. I just looked for a day or two. Um, you can you can Google that. I mean, I'm gonna look up, just real quick, Omega 1968, I'm just Googling on watch, or I'm going on watch recon. Um, well, here's one, I mean, see the, yeah, there's a, there's a 1968. So they might, they might be there. Um, Here's one from 1968. It says circa 1968. So you can find them. I, that's you know again. That's you have to ask yourself that question. Um, if you don't care, then I would look at a more recent watch. I would look at something from from the 21st century. Um, the other thing that over you know, even though the watch itself has pretty much not changed since the late 60s, one thing that has changed is the bracelet. And I actually think the bracelet got better and better. They've improved it along the way. There are several different bracelets that have been used. Um, and I don't know the cutoff dates for each one, but I'm putting a link down below, which has a really good overview of the Speedmaster bracelets. So you can also look at that and figure out which one you like the most. And then when you're searching for a, a moon watch, you can find that. Um, so yeah, I. I'm gonna wrap this up. I don't know if I covered all of your questions. Oh, one thing you asked about the 861 versus 1861. You know, I didn't, I actually didn't, don't know the answer to that and I didn't look it up. Um, you can Google that. Um, like I just looked up, here's here's an article on the Omega forums that says Speedmaster Calvert's 321 versus 861 versus 1861. 
and I here's uh, somebody's responses. They're very similar movements. They are they're all extremely strong and reliable movements, and they have all been used in outer space. The caliber of 321 was the first iteration, is the most sought after, also the fewest number produced. Caliber 321 features a column wheel, more elaborate bridges, and is more complicated to service and maintain. It's no more accurate or reliable, but is more beautiful in some intangible way, more special than the 861 and 1861. So there are pluses and minuses practically, and for daily wear and ease of maintenance and part sources, sourcing, 861 slash 1861 is better. For the collector, it has to be 321. That was from DSIO on the Omega forum. So thank you, DSIO. Um, so yeah, I think that's a great response. The 321 is the traditional older one. Um, 861 is later, simpler, doesn't have the collecting cachet, but it would also be a lot easier to take care of and less expensive to take care of and less expensive to purchase. That's the other thing. So um, I think that's something for you, again, to consider when you're thinking about whether to go vintage or new, newer, etc. cetera. Um, so yeah, I hope that was helpful and satisfactory. Um, I don't think there are any, I think I covered pretty much everything. All right, so let me know what you think, and anyone else, feel free to um, chime in for some thoughts for JB. JB, if you have any other questions, if I didn't cover, um, just email me or in the comments field. All right, later. All right, good afternoon, folks. I've got a uh, longish video to make today. Well, we'll see how long it is. Um, this is a actual paid request. I appreciate this. Um, I received a generous donation from JB from Portland. Um, and so I guess I gotta take this seriously. <laughs> um, I've got notes, so that, that will help me out. Um, JB has interested in a Speedmaster, particularly, I think, the Moonwatch. So we're gonna go into that um, in some depth today. He also has some other general questions about buying watches used. So we'll, we'll, um, we'll touch upon a bunch of different things. What I'll do is I'll read through his email and then I have some notes for in response to um, each of his questions. Um, yeah, again, I wanna just clarify as far as donations and such go, the included moon phase, the 3876.50. What do you think? But I am all confused about different vintages, movements, etc. What is a normal price range for a newer used Speedmaster? All right, so in order to answer this question, I need to go into what a Speedmaster is and a little bit of the history because I think that will help you understand what you're looking at. Um, you know, it's, there, there are a few, Omega has several different ranges, but they really have two ranges that are their, their, their main ranges of watches. And that's one is the Speedmaster and the other is the Seamaster. There's also the DeVille and there's some other ones, but um, the Planet Oceans and, and the Aquaterra, they're both offshoots of the Seamaster, although they really almost consider them different watches. Um, so the Seamaster is the dive watch, of course, while the Speedmaster, all miles being exploratory, like it's not just straight up bebop, but it's not, it's like before he did too much drugs. <laughs> Um, some of his stuff in the early 70s, early to mid 70s, it's great, you know, like Agartha, Pangea, that sort of thing. Um, but it tends to be pretty intense and hard for background music. Um, one of my favorites is Live Evil, which is a um, live album around the same era, a little, maybe a couple of years later. Anyways, in a silent way, I think it's 1968. Um, yeah, anyways, so, so back to the Speedmaster. Um, so, but if you're talking about the moon watch, um, the price range for a newer used Speedmaster Professional, AKA the moon watch, is generally between about $2,000 and $3,000 US dollars. Generally around $2,500 is a sports watch. Um, and as far as I understand it, the well, we'll talk about the history in a moment. Just to go into your, your question about price, um, you know, prices range really widely for Speedmasters because there's a wide array of different Speedmasters. Um, they, the cheapest ones I've seen are in the $1,000 to $1,500 range, 
but those aren't the professional. Those aren't the moon watches. Um, and they tend to be, I think, 1980s, 90s, 2000s. Um, used mo models, there's tons of them out there on eBay. Um, and for used watches, they go all the way up to six, seven, eight thousand dollars for the dark side of the moon. Um, and I'm sure there's some limited editions that are expensive like that. By the way, we're listening to Miles Davis in a silent way, one of one of his best. I played it on this here before. Um, it's nice because I like this album because it um, it's still. Um, if you email me, and my email is in the about page. Um, and asked me to do a video request. It's it's by no means required um, to donate or to give me money <laughs> to make a video. It will expedite the video, and I do appreciate it because it does take time um, to make these. So yeah, it's but it's don't feel like you have to do it. It's by no means you know I'm not gonna be mad or you know so I'm not gonna be like the barista that doesn't get the tip. <laughs> um, anyways. So let's let's take a look at JB's um, email. All right. So JB says, "Love your videos. You seem to be one of the more rational watch reviewers out there." Thank you, JB. Um, I can be irrational too. <laughs> um, I'm considering buying a used Speedmaster, and I've been looking at it at a few on eBay. I like the one with.